So I'm Dom Smales. I run Gleam Futures, which is a digital-first talent management company. We've been going for six years now. Uh, we essentially manage talent and their careers in the entertainment industry across multi-platforms. It just so happens that all the talent that we look after uh, started their career and grew their audience on digital platforms star, uh, first. Good morning. So I'm David Black. I'm Managing Director of Branding and Consumer Markets for Google UK. So I run the business end of uh, the YouTube business for Google UK, and I look after some of our biggest brand partnerships in the UK. Hi, I'm uh, JP Mayu. I'm the VP of Global Brands and Agencies at Twitter. So I manage uh, Twitter's relationship with the largest brands around the world and uh, our agency partners, both media agencies and creative agencies. My name is uh, John Skagma. I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Juca Media. Um, we are uh, big in the short form user generated world. We get about 2. Point, uh, I'm sorry, 1.5 billion views a month across many platforms. And uh, we built this infrastructure on the building not just to discover, but also acquire and monetize this content. Great. And um, my name is Cliff. I'm a partner of a law firm, Lewis Silkin, specializing in digital media and brand entertainment. I'm also the founder and director of a boutique advisory firm called Eleven. It's a spinal tap gag. Right, what we're going to do is I'm going to ask some questions of the panel um, individually. I'm going to be asking people some broader questions from the panel as well. And also, there's the opportunity for you to interact as well. So for those of you with a connected mobile device, which I suspect is pretty much a lot of you, if you go to the mix with two Ms, dot com and upload your questions, and then I'll have the opportunity to put some of those questions to this august panel as well. So I'm going to start with you, Dom. And we've heard Marcus's own story, but Gleam has been literally at the forefront of social talents. Tell us about this phenomenon. Uh, so six years ago, I worked for a production company, a TV and radio production company, and we were making content for radio stations and certain TV networks. And uh, Facebook was just beginning to get very popular, and I was noticing how the younger people in the office were spending a lot more time on Facebook than they were doing the work that they were supposed to be doing. Um, so I checked it out, and I became fairly quickly obsessed by social media, and YouTube in particular. And what fascinated me about YouTube was the fact that I kept seeing these two girls ending up on the home page of YouTube as being amongst the most popular videos served on YouTube in the world on any one particular day. And I'd never seen these girls before. They weren't celebrities on TV or magazines or radio. Uh, and they were also up there amongst the viral videos that I was really used to seeing on the home page of YouTube, which were naked people walking into plate glass windows, animals on skateboards, and Ferraris crashing. Um, but these girls were just kind of making uh, makeup tutorials. And they were there every week up amongst these huge videos, doing 500, 600,000 views on these videos. And so I dropped them a note, and it was just interested to meet them. And they came in, and it just so happens I was the first kind of commercial person to drop them a note. And we got on well, and they asked me for advice. And I had some commercial media experience, so I advised them on a few things. And fast forward six years, we now look after a roster of only 28 talent in the world through offices in London and Los Angeles. And they're the very top talent in the world at doing what they do. Uh, and we advise them uh, across multi-platform commercial decisions and partnerships, including publishing, licensing, uh, movies, um, as well as brand collaborations and endorsements. Yep. Uh, and basically facilitate them to have long, successful careers in the entertainment business, rather than have a flash in the pan. These are young people who are enormously talented at connecting with audiences on a global scale and relating to people on a global scale across language barriers, across cultural differences, um, and serving video and content to them in really um, low, relatively low production budget environment. But they still, you know, as you mentioned, and as it, during your chat with Marcus had pointed out, it's, it's reaching more people than the big broadcasters can reach. So for people like Zoella and Marcus and the others as well, it's a global 
platform really isn't it? it's a global Abs reach absolutely yeah yeah and that's kind of like that's that's something to get over i think for brand owners and networks is that this audience is totally global there's not for someone like marcus there's not a country in the world that gets the internet that doesn't watch marcus butler great um david google youtube i mean you know marcus said you know the he described as a youtuber as it were, even though he does use many other platforms as well. But YouTube really was the pioneer in this space, wasn't it? And how can you know, brands learn from using this kind of short form content? You know, the very opposite of what Netflix were talking about, really, in many ways. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't think it's about short form or long form. I, th I think it's when you listen to Marcus and the other amazing stars of YouTube, really, it's about authenticity. And so having that authentic voice has allowed them to build up absolutely huge audiences. So you look across YouTube, YouTube now reaches a billion users every month. Watch time's growing 60% year on year. So there's a huge audience. And it's really engaged as well. I mean, they, you look at the level of comment and commentary around Marcus and others' videos, it's absolutely fantastic to see. So there's real reach and there's real engagement too. And so we think that's an amazing opportunity for brands. It's an amazing opportunity for brands to reach that audience at a time when they're really engaged, to speak to them in a really authentic way. And that could be through advertising, that could be through <coughs> um, collaboration, that can be through partnership. Um, of the 100 top global brands, all of them advertised on YouTube over the last year. So for brands, this is a real phenomenon. We'd say to brands, get involved, start advertising, start taking part in the platform. Okay. Um, JP um, from Twitter. People tend to think of Twitter as a text-based platform, but how does it work with social video? Where have you been for the past three years, Cliff? Uh, who is on Twitter here? Okay. You guys don't look at Twitter as a text-based platform, I hope. You know, we added pictures and videos. Um, video is actually the biggest uh, change we're seeing on Twitter. Uh, our video consumption has grown by 200x over the past 12 months. And as a marketer, if you look at the two biggest trends affecting users and with a major impact for brand, is number one, the change in device connection from desktop to mobile. Mobile is driving 100% of the growth in digital time spend. And the second biz biggest driver is video. Brands love videos, but users love video. As, uh, as Marcus was saying, obviously the success of YouTube. Um, so mobile video is the biggest uh, focus for Twitter. And on Twitter, 92% of the video views are on mobile. So when you think of Twitter, think of Twitter as a mobile video platform with a very unique positioning in the marketplace. We believe that Twitter is your live connection to culture. So when something happens in the world, it happens on Twitter. Often Twitter is a reflection of the zeitgeist, the live world. And in many occasions, Twitter has actually drive the culture, influence events. There's many movements that happen around the world over the past two years driven by Twitter. So think of Twitter as a mobile video platform that enables you to have a live connection to the culture around you. Okay. Um, thank you, JP. Um, John, um, I want to talk to you. Um, we saw in Mark Mulligan's excellent talk this morning um, about this flight you know, towards long-form scripted content. We saw that in the Netflix presentation this morning as well. Whereas Jukin appears to be thriving, doing the very opposite of long-form scripted content. Why is that working for Jukin and how? Um, for us, I mean, we view the world much differently. Um, we look at kind of these short-form videos that are between the length of 10 and 120 seconds long. And sometimes we do make them into long form, more premium content, all the way up to 60 minutes. But really for us, these uh, individual videos are really the building blocks um, of our entire company. And they work so well, especially on these devices, not just for capturing content, but also um, just for viewing content. And I believe right now, uh, we just pulled the statistic that 80% of our views on, on Facebook are mobile right now, which is, is pretty insane. Okay. Well, Dom, I mean, I'll bring that back to you. I mean, you know, there's been a lot about 
engaging content, compelling content, long and short form, using lots of platforms as well. But a lot of it is about engaging with the talent. Where do you see the engagement happening most with regard to your talent that you work with? So th this, is, this is the key. There is all kinds of content and platforms and uh, everything's fragmenting, as we hear quite a lot. Um, I think it is about that engagement between an audience and a talent. Um, and a talent brand can be you know, a show as well as individual talent as well. Um, primarily, a lot of the engagement was going on on YouTube. That's where we, the, the thick end of the funnel is where the enormous audiences were and where a lot of the engagement is going on. Over the last couple of years, it's proliferated slightly into uh, Snapchat. It's incredible. The, the immediacy of the engagement from an audience to Snapchat on mobile is amazing. We're talking about 800,000 opens within three or four hours on a, uh, a single picture posted to Snapchat from big talent like Marcus. Um, the engagement you see on uh, Twitter and Instagram is also enormous. Uh, but still, the majority of those huge audiences and them engaging all at the same time is on YouTube for us. On a mobile device or? On mobile, yeah. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Um, David, I, mean, I want to ask you a question about where this content is consumed, because a lot of it, Marcus talked about it being content on the go, as it were, but how do you reach an audience at home? Yeah, so it's a great question. So over half the views on YouTube are on mobile devices now and growing incredibly quickly. In my market, the UK, up over 200% year on year, so it's in phenomenal mobile growth. Um, but I think. When you think about marketers, really, it's about how do you reach the right audience with the right message at the right time. So I always think for when, when you're planning campaigns, think about the new WWW, what they want, when they want it, where they want it. And so an enormous amount of the growth is coming from users watching at home. So you, we saw during the Super Bowl huge spikes in viewership on YouTube while people were also watching TV. There were people out on the go, on the move, watching YouTube videos, and then people at their desks at work watching as well. So users watching at the time and place that's right for them across all of those modes of use. And so I'd say to marketers, how do you reach consumers at the moment that matters? Because more and more of those moments are on YouTube. So you're saying they might not actually be watching the advert that's on the television. Is that right? <laughs> I, I, you can draw your own conclusions <laughs> from that. Uh, but I think we do see a lot of dual screening going on. But increasingly, you sort of think about what's the most engaging screen. I'd suggest it might be the one that you're holding in the palm of your hand in front of your face. There's got to be real engagement there. And that's got to be a great opportunity for marketers. Okay. Um, JP, um, this is a mobile congress. I want to talk to that, those points that both Dom and David have made about the importance of mobile and what the proximity of that time and space means for your business. You said it's about currency and social currency, but tell me about the sort of immediacy of engagement. So, so Twitter is really a mobile uh, platform. Uh, again, 92% of, of video views are on mobile. Uh, across the world, across markets, uh, 85 to 90% of our users are on mobile. Uh, what's interesting is that from a content creation, from a content consumption, and from a branding standpoint, I believe we are just at the beginning of understanding mobile behaviors. So let me give you a very simple uh, example. People watch ads because ads pay for media. The ads have sound, usually. On mobile, autoplay video don't have sounds because sound becomes a huge interruption in the mobile behavior. So we are starting to work with brands, creative agencies, and media agencies to make them understand that it is possible to have a huge brand impact with content on mobile without sound. That doesn't mean that if the user doesn't tap or taps on the video, they are going to listen to the sound. But understanding the mobile behavior is really at the beginning of, uh, uh, we're at the beginning of, of that. There's a lot of research we're doing. For example, we, had, we found some research that shows that mobile video ads need to have in the first two or three seconds a brand 
impression. Whether it's a product, whether it's the name of the brand, whether it's a celebrity, you need to hook the viewer so the viewer continues to watch the video. Because in a stream base, whether it's Snapchat, Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, everything is a stream. In a stream based user behavior, you need to have an arresting moment in the first two or three seconds of your video. So there's a lot of research that is happening right now to help the industry understand what mobile video consumption is and how it differs from a desktop or TV consumption. OK, so John, we've heard about engagement, we've heard about currency, we've heard about quality and depth. And at the heart of your content that's created by Jukin appears to be shareability. How does a company like Jukin monetize that? Well, the good thing about our content, it's very, very shareable at the end of the day. And it's very, very snackable. I mean, I, I'm a firm believer that user-generated user content is almost the most shareable content. But at the same time, is our job is to help monetize that content. And we're doing it a variety of different ways. It's um, everything from licensing. When I mean licensing, that's traditional licensing to, a, to, a linear, to linear networks, whether it's news shows, morning shows, talk shows, clip shows. Um, we're licensing um, for uh, ad campaigns and working with brands. At the same time, we're syndicating our content. And what I mean by syndication, it's going into a um, MRSS feed that's going into another um, publication or digital publications um, network. And we're working with about 40 or so. And that content goes into this kind of pipeline on a real-time basis. And that's usually against ad revenue. At the same time as we're, we're monetizing on Facebook, we're monetizing on YouTube, obviously for, um, with Google AdSense. Um, so there's a multiple different ways that we're taking that same content, what I meant before, through the building box of the whole company, that we have multiple revenue streams coming from this individual piece of content. And that even goes into our programming, and then we take that content program um, some really big brands that, it, that we incubate on YouTube. Okay. Dom, I want to take it away from the digital world and expand on a conversation that I started with Marcus about that engagement crossing over from the mobile device to the real world and the cut yeah. through that the talent you're working with and the impact they have in the so-called real world. Could you talk to that for a, for a bit, please? Yeah. So the I think the premise of the success that we're experiencing, our talent are experiencing, is that it's about audiences' uh, relationship with talent that they like. And I think that whilst, uh, as I said earlier, that all these devices and platforms are proliferating, actually it's about that. Re that's the key relationship. And it just so happens that these guys have uh, platforms that they can properly talk to their audience through um, without having to go through another gatekeeper. So. You know, Marcus doesn't have to wait for the editor of a, uh, of a magazine in order to talk to an audience through that editor's audience. He doesn't have to approach a studio boss, get commissioned, whatever else, in order to get on someone else's network or platform or channel. He has a, rela a direct relationship with, with the audience um, through social media platforms. Um, that audience doesn't care that much about what brand that platform has. They care about the relationship that they have with the talent, how easy it is to connect with the talent, how available it is, and how easily distributed the content is, and it goes from there, really. So we're seeing uh, 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 an evolution at the moment in audiences migrating very freely between platforms and devices uh, and shows, mainly. So in the last 12 months, we've had um, Zoe, Zoella, one of our talent, um, appear on the Great British Bake Off on BBC Two. Great British Bake Off being uh, not particularly a kind of like Generation Y sort of show, mm. but um, Zoe loves baking and she was approached to do it for charity. It was part of the Comic Relief series of Bake Off. And on she went with Jonathan Ross and Got One and Abby Clancy, I think it was as well. And that night that Zoe appeared baking her beach hut, there were like 33% more 16 to 34 year olds watching BBC Two that night. Right. It was the highest rating show of the series of Bake Off and the audiences left once Zoe wasn't on the next series, they, off they went again. And I had anecdotal stories of teenagers saying to their parents, oh, I really like that Bake Off thing and, and it was great watching Zoe, but who were those other people mm. on there? <laughs> um, and just recently, in fact this Saturday, Marcus and Alfie were on Saturday Night Takeaway with Ant and Deck. And they were on for maybe a total of 10 seconds or something like that on the show. 
But of course, the boys were really active on their platform, saying that they were going to be on the show. And uh, the show saw their biggest uh, 15 to 34 year old audience in a very long time. It was uh, an extra million viewers there. I don't know how many of those extra million viewers were down to the boys being there, but there was a, a, their biggest ever 15 to 34 year old audience. So I, I hope that it made a big contribution. Um, and we're seeing, and the publishing as well, we're seeing audiences just go to the point of access to the talent and then making an engagement through a different platform. So books is another good example. So you are disrupting probably the oldest form of permanent content, books, with yeah. your talent right now. Yeah, so we, uh, in the last 18 months or so, our roster sold maybe two and a half million books globally. Um, and I hope that, I'm hoping that, the two and a half million people that have bought books published by people like Marcus, um, might not have been so keen on publishing books before, so there are kind of like extra readers out there uh, that are enjoying it. But again, it's the same thing. They're going to, it just so happens that Marcus's content is available in the form in between two covers of a book rather than on a YouTube channel or anywhere else. And they're just as predisposed to go and enjoy that content at Waterstones or WH Smith as they would be if they went onto YouTube. Okay, so we've talked about the phenomenon, it's real. And for this reason, platforms, brands, commercial partners want to work with talent and content like this. So I want to really hone in on the business of it, really. And David, of course, a lot of them start with YouTube, as it were. Uh, I think a lot of them do it well. I think a lot of them do it quite badly, actually. I mean, what's, what's an example of a great brand partnership on, on YouTube? And how can a brand work with YouTube? Because it feels like the Wild West for a lot of brands, right? Yeah, I think, well, actually, the heart of it is really simple. It's really good brand marketing. It's about understanding what are the audiences that you're trying to reach. It's about having a really clear message where you can impact that audience at the moments that matter for them. And the great thing about YouTube is there's a really engaged audience there. And it's about delivering measurable business, business results. That's exactly what YouTube does. There's loads of evidence that shows the brand uplift that marketers receive on YouTube is significant. And so what are the things you can do? I think campaign, create, collaborate. The first and most obvious thing to do is, is advertise on there. There's a billion users every month. As I said, watch time's up significantly year on year, up 60% year on year. 400 hours of new content are getting uploaded every minute. So there's a huge and engaged audience there watching every genre of content under the sun, including the amazing content being created by YouTubers like Marcus. So the first thing to do is to, is to advertise on it, to campaign, to run campaigns. And so we've been working really hard to come up with ad formats that work hard for brands, formats like TrueView, where users can choose to skip them after five seconds, but brands only pay when a user's watched the whole ad. And so that's amazing. That works for users. They've got a choice of whether to watch or not. And it works for brands because they're only paying when a user's chosen to engage. And that's running with full sight and sound and motion. And so that's an amazing experience. Or if for brands that want something much simpler, we can also do TV style buying. You just buy a demographic or a content package just like you can on TV. So campaigning is the easiest thing. Once you're up and running with that, you can then collaborate and create too. And so we see brands doing that more and more. So to JP, um, we've talked about content and it started on YouTube as well, but you've firmly put me in my place about what Twitter really is. I mean, how does it really punch above its weight in this social context to achieve that cut through for, for talent and content and brands? Um, yeah, I think you, you can think of Twitter as a, as a platform of influence. Um, when, when we look at uh, people that have influenced their community, whether it's, it's Marcus or whether it's the president uh, of the United States or whether it's Taylor Swift. Every single influencer in the world is, is on Twitter um, and, and basically use Twitter as a way to uh, communicate their message. Um, during the Super Bowl, uh, I, I don't know if there's any American here, but during the Super Bowl there was a major football player that announced his retirement and he basically announced it with a single tweet where he posted a picture of his cleats, his shoes, hanging. Just, that was it, no words, no emoji, just a picture with his cleats. Um, so we see a lot of influencers 
uh, leveraging Twitter as a platform to communicate, and then they continue the conversation on Facebook and, and, and other platforms. So from, from a brand standpoint, uh, what's interesting is how do brands leverage the, this, this audience, which is very passionate to connect with influencers and content creators? How does the brand uh, uh, play in, in that space? And we look at two, um, two kind of ways for a brand to play. One is the everyday moment. People are on Twitter every day, the same way that Google search has shown that people search for keywords, key topics, every day. And by the way, I'm going to tell you something that is sad for us human beings. We are extremely predictable. From week to week, month to month, years to years, we search for the same thing at the same time of the day. And it's the same thing on Twitter. We tweet roughly about the same thing every day or every month. And every year there's a Valentine's Day, and every year there's a summer, and we tweet about ice cream and thirsty and so forth. So every word in a tweet is a signal of intent, similar to Google search. There's a signal of intent, so brands capture that signal of intent and target the consumer at the right time. So that's one way. It's kind of everyday planning on Twitter for the brand to connect with this very passionate audience. The second type is around campaign, and a lot of the campaign is around Twitter and TV. You may be familiar that Twitter is the second screen for TV. Most people that are watching TV that want to engage with the show actually have their Twitter app open. And either they read the tweets about the show or they actually produce, they create content. So all the TV shows now have a Twitter strategy as a companion piece to, uh, to the TV program. And we're working with brands to leverage that. So if a brand buys a TV show, they should buy an activation on Twitter at the same time because they know their audience will be both watching TV but also engage on, uh, on Twitter. Okay. So, John, um, in lots of the talks with, uh, this morning, we've talked about walled gardens and locking up content, whereas you talked about the shareability and the distribution of Jukin's content and how you monetize it. But talk to us about how you work with other platforms in order to amplify your content and achieve those crazy numbers that channels like Fail Army and People Are Awesome get. Yeah, um, it's really interesting because um, it's kind of like what I was talking about before about how many different ways we can monetize content. Well, it's the same way with amplification. Uh, they really go hand in hand. When you, we have this individual video, people always come to us, whether it's brands, whether it's just individual creators, they say, how, 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 do, you, how do you find so many videos and how do you make them go uh, viral? But at the end of the day, we're really kind of using our monetization in our network to actually push this content so we could monetize it and then amplify it at the same time. So we have that individual video, we're liking and sharing it with our network so that people are awesome, which is over, our, our own old brands have over 30 million fans, so we're liking and sharing it there, starting to push, push it to go viral as, as the views go up. Same time as views go up, we're actually then licensing that content because all of a sudden this, this, this video is creating virality and all of a sudden the morning shows and I'll, and I'll use like Good Morning America in, in the States, they want to license that content to be the air first thing on the morning. So we license them at a license fee, then they air it on television and this is a really great where convergence where the linear and digital are really combined. They air that, the video airs on television. What do you do? You go home and you look it up. And so more licensing demand creates more variety, more variety creates more licensing demand, and it really becomes a virtuous cycle. So they're paying you to distribute your content. Exactly, and it works out very nicely. Then we're syndicating it out to, the, to our syndication platforms, to the Yahoo's, to the AOL's, so it's on the front page of there. So again, it's where amplification and monetization really meet. Great. Um, Dom, so brands, they all want to work with your talent, right? They really want to achieve those audiences and work with people like Marcus and get to understand them as well. So it feels like there's a real qualitative gain to working with social talent, digital first talent. But you know, to what extent can you provide the kind of quantitative results that brands are always looking for? Mm. You, well, it depends on what metrics you're measuring that 
with. So if you're looking for, and as I believe, and I think probably a lot of this panel will think as well, is that the really key metric here is engagement. Uh, if you want to measure engagement, there are algorithms that you can apply to that to, to get a, a result. And you can show really clearly how the engagement differs between uh, someone who is native digital first talent talking on a platform about a project, a brand, a, a cause, etc., versus a piece of served media. Um, we have, there's all kinds of case studies in terms of pure sales uplift being demonstrated from, uh, from uh, social talent talking about something. A good, a good, I'll give you a soft example, which is we had our Christmas party this year at a, a hotel in uh, Hampshire, and the hotel gave us a bit of a discount, but we, we ended up paying a lot of money for the Christmas party. But I have a good relationship with the commercial director there, and she was able to share with me what happened to the hotel's bookings after we'd had a Christmas party there. It's worth noting that because the entire roster were in one place at one time, all talking about the same subject, it, there was quite a lot of buzz online about that particular hotel. In fact, there were 4.2 million views served on YouTube about that particular hotel over the month of December. Um, I spoke to the lady recently, and she shared with me very excitedly that they just had their best January ever in the history of the hotel. Their uh, internet traffic on their website was up by 57%, and bookings were up by 55% year on year for January. And you wouldn't think that's a, that pushes back on that aid old adage that it's only kids in their bedrooms that are watching this stuff. It's no one with real spending power. But this is a luxury hotel in Hampshire. Not many. 12 or 13 year olds are going to be able to afford a room there, but yet their bookings are up 55% year on year. Wow, so there's something big going on here, David. Um, I didn't think I'd ever use the words Zoella and Donald Trump in the same sentence. <laughs> you know, th we see. Please don't ever again either. No, no, I'll try not to. Um, apart from our audience is huge. Um, but, David, we're seeing this kind of paradigm shift of paid for media to owned media to this earned media as it were. Is there any room for paid right now, or is it better to have a bunch of Dominic's talents there sort of tweeting about you in order to build your business online? It's about using the right marketing mix, isn't it? And I mean, there is something big going on here. So I was looking at the, the latest figures in my market, my home market, the UK. So YouTube now reaches 100% of under 35s every month. It's something like 99.7% of under 35s every month. But now half the audience is over 35 as well. So it's a huge millennial audience on YouTube. But actually, the audience is mainstream. And so how do you think about that? It's, it's about using the right marketing mix. It's about using paid and owned and earned together to be able to deliver the biggest brand impact that you can to deliver the reach, to deliver the impact, and to deliver the results that you're looking for as a marketer. And so we'd always say, you know, understand which are the right levers to pull in that mix. But for many brands, the first step is run paid media effectively. Take TV campaigns, run them on YouTube. Beyond that, create bespoke for YouTube campaigns, because actually then you can deliver something that's native to the platform, that speaks in a very authentic tone of voice to the audience that you're looking for. And then you can start using owned and earned alongside that to deliver an even bigger uplift. And as brands get more advanced, they then begin to collaborate with great content partners and YouTubers to do even more sophisticated things too. So there's a whole journey a brand can go on. But the, the first kind of fundamental step is start using the platform. And often that first step is paid. JP, I'm going to talk about another bit of this whole social, me uh, social video phenomenon. So broadcast networks are investing heavily in live events and events of the moment, as it were. And Twitter and Periscope and Vine do, of course, of all the channels, feel the most of the moment or of that moment as well. I mean, to what extent is live content at the heart of Twitter's USP, and how does that fit into this whole phenomena and, and, and the mix, as, uh, as David refers to? So, so if you look at TV ratings across most markets, uh, they are going down. You agree? TV ratings are going down? Yeah? OK. Um, except for live events. So big sports event, awards show, some season premiere or season finale, and Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones is the only uh, episodic, uh, maybe Downton Abbey. We have a couple of Brits. Uh, Downton Abbey is pretty big um, live. Um, 
So what is happening is that the TV networks understand that their live properties are basically the horse that is going to drive most of their profitability. So they are now looking at other platforms, such as Twitter, to basically amplify and augment their reach and the success of their, their content. Um, so actually, I came to Twitter via an acquisition. I joined Twitter three years ago. I was the CEO of a company called Bluefin Labs. And Bluefin Labs was a bunch of uh, MIT engineers and me, uh, not an engineer. Um, and Bluefin was looking at the TV as a stimulus media, which is a media that basically creates a conversation. But TV doesn't generate the conversation, it just triggers it. The conversation happens on social platform or in real life. And Bluefin Labs was measuring the conversation, analyzing the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, and blogs as a response mechanism to the TV content. And we realized through our data that there is this amazing synergy happening between TV and social platform. Twitter being such a live platform, most of the conversation was on Twitter, but a fair amount of, of conversation was also on Facebook. So Twitter is indeed this very live platform, and the latest app that we bought um, and that we're building is Periscope. Anybody knows Periscope? Okay, anybody from Newcastle in England here, no? So a month ago, there was two million people looking at someone periscoping people in Newcastle crossing a puddle. You know what a puddle is? Like a, you know, there's torrential rain in Newcastle. There was rain, and there was a big puddle, and people could not cross the street because there was so much water. So someone in the building right next to the puddle periscoped that. There was two million views of that scope. Someone brought a surfboard to cross the puddle. People were, so suddenly it became a phenomenon in the UK. <laughs> the TV broadcasters started to send their crews, all because Periscope, which is basically the ability to give each of you the live broadcasting uh, capability. Periscope drove this amazing phenomenon. Um, I don't know what people are doing in Newcastle to, uh, to spend that, that, much, that much time crossing puddles, uh, <laughs> but that's, uh, uh, that's a different question. So live is definitely the unique characteristic of Twitter and Periscope, and I think it creates very interesting synergies with the, the, the TV networks. Okay. Well, we now know what passes for entertainment in Newcastle. Um, <laughs> John, um, sorry to be boring for a moment, but I am a lawyer by way of my background. <laughs> and uh, there's lots of talk about sharing, but sharing seems to be quite a malleable concept because, you know, if you share something with permission, that's fine. But if you share something without permission, it's a word closer to stealing. Um, how do you, as a content owner, deal with this whole world where your content is flying everywhere at a, at a rate of knots? Well, we're very okay with, with sharing, even if we, you don't have permission. What we're not okay is taking that video, ripping it, taking it down, and then uploading on another video player, that then, then you can just start monetizing. <clears throat> so we're totally not okay with that. I don't think any content owner would be okay with that. Um, what I mentioned before, that user-generated content is the most shareable content in the world, but it's also probably the ripped, most ripped and most stolen content in the world. And as you can imagine, there are, there's a lot of these videos that are, you may see on your newsfeed. There are companies that are actually building brands, they're monetizing, they're building websites, they're building pages, they're building their social outreach from user-generated content. That's everything from images, everything from memes, from GIFs, from these individual videos. So unfortunately, we have to kind of police our content. And so we've dedicated an entire rights management team to help police our content. And we have about a dozen or so folks that are looking on all these different platforms. We're looking, we're using third-party technologies, whether that's YouTube's content ID system, which happens to be one of the, be one of the best things out there, but also happens to be one of the only things out there, unfortunately, which is a great fingerprinting technology but it can only capture so much. And it's really only really good at capturing stuff with a really good reference file. Again, unfortunately, user-generated content doesn't have a good reference file because it's, a lot, it's really shaky, the audio is really not perfect. So we have to actually do a lot of manual searches. We've helped build some technology that help us kind of find more of our content. But 
if you're a content owner at the end of the day, we have to protect our content. And so we take rights management, we take infringement very seriously, but our goal is to always turn an infringer into a licensing partner, you know? Um, I think Facebook told us that we DMCA'd Facebook more, our company DMCA'd Facebook more than any other company on the planet, wow. or something in one particular month. But because they had a huge problem, they still have a huge problem as far as con people um, infringing on the content. And lucky enough, we're now working with them pretty closely on a daily basis to help build their product and technology, to help develop their content ID system. But that's an interesting counterpoint to um, the music industry, which just saw infringement as a huge threat. You've embraced it as an opportunity, right? A absolutely. I mean, we, 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 we turn almost infringers into customers. And that's, our, and that's our absolute goal. We don't want to be litigious at the end of the day. Right. I suspect that concept may be picked up later on. Um, I'm going to throw over to some of the questions that we've had from the audience. Please keep sending them through to the doublemmix.com. And I've got one here, which I think I probably need to ask of um, Dominic, which is, aren't you helping to build this world of a cult of celebrity and distracting people with the kind of wealth? Uh, people. The kids, they just want to be YouTubers, and they just want to be rich, as it were. To what extent are you adding to the tapestry of life, or are you taking away from it? <laughs> That's not my question. That's from someone in the audience. <laughs> so I think that just because of what's happened with technology and these platforms over the last couple of years, being a, a YouTuber, for want of a better description, is a bona fide career if you want to get into the entertainment business now. Um, it doesn't change the fact that, like the traditional entertainment industry, there's a really thin seam of proper big A-list talent, and not everybody can do it. There's going to be thousands and thousands and thousands of people that want to do it, and with an internet connection and a webcam, they can have a crack at it. But there's, there's still only going to be the, the very top tier that are able to achieve the things that some of the talent we're talking about now can achieve and physically move the dial. Um, I would hope that we are adding to the rich choice there is of uh, consumers and audiences able to interact with talent. Um, and just like any other platform, it is only talent that will prevail. So I'm hoping that that um, is a good enough filter to make sure that everything is not dumbed down too much. Okay. Uh, I'd love did you want to add to that? I'd add to that. I think the reality, what's great is, Consumers now have more choice than ever before. Mm -hmm. What that's showing is that the stars of today are now YouTube stars. There was some great research in uh, Variety magazine a few weeks ago that showed that for US millennials, the top stars on YouTube are bigger for them than the stars of TV or Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So there's this amazing engaged audience watching YouTube every day, watching these stars. And then the interesting thing is actually the, the, the stars that we think of as, as mainstream and now coming onto YouTube too, you know, the likes of Jamie Oliver building his food yeah. tube channel. So we're seeing that more and more as well. I don't think it replaces a celebrity, like Tom Cruise is a movie star. It doesn't make Tom Cruise less relevant to a millennial audience. I think that p audiences kind of snack on different bits of content depending on what they have an appetite for at the time. It just so happens that big social media platforms are, 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 are replacing, uh, a, they're, they're forming a huge, a uh, portion of the uh, media and entertainment appetite of a generation of audiences, basically. JP? Uh, I, I, let me take a slightly different uh, angle. Uh, so I agree with, with, with the panelists, but, but I actually believe it's a fantastic opportunity uh, for, for the, the, the younger generation. So I have a 17 year old, and when I grew up, I couldn't create content. I mean, you know, the camera is quite expensive. Editing, I had no editing suite or editing bay. Um, today, the tools for creation, editing, and distribution are so easy to use and at the you know, availability of so many people. So whether people are going to get rich, you know, like Marcus or other, actually doesn't matter. What really matters is that we are now enabling our younger generation to think and create together. And in the past, you had the makers and you had the thinker. Today, you have basically people that can think and make things together. And I have numerous examples of, of my daughter's friends that create a video game. A video game, one minute on that, a video game 
to demystify female uh, menstruations. It's a tampon game, very well known in the US now, where basically you're shooting, but instead of shooting bullets, you shoot tampons. <coughs> when the tampons hit the person, it creates blood. She did that as part of Girls Who Code. You guys familiar with Girls Who Code? In a summer, two months later, she was on the morning show, the, the Good Morning, actually, uh, one of the Good Morning show on TV networks. And all this because she had an idea. The idea was fantastic. 20 years ago, she could not have created that game. But the idea was so fantastic that she basically decided to create the game, distribute the game, and it got picked up by the press. Very important topic for, for girls around the world. The tool of creation and distribution are so simple now that this person, 17-year-old girl, was able to create that and have so much impact in the world. So whether you, you make money, that doesn't actually, that's secondary. The ability to give those tools to younger people, I think it's fabulous. Well, John, let me slightly pokey here, you know. You've got something like Fail Army. It's hilarious. Everyone loves it. It's just people getting hurt, right? Or am I wrong? I, I think it's pure entertainment. I think, um, you know, what's so good about some of this content that's user-generated content, it's very global, it's universal, it's language agnostic. And when it comes to Fail Army, which is a compilation that we release twice a week of people falling over, I like to say an ouch is an ouch in any language. And people really do enjoy it. <laughs> now, a number of the questions that are coming through are sort of of the same theme. So I'm going to throw the theme out to, to the panel here, which is about does it risk becoming formulaic, working with certain platforms in certain ways, as it were? And how do talent and content owners use these platforms in order to make sure that that mix is refreshed and relevant? Dom? I, I think talking from a talent perspective, talent use different platforms for <coughs> different means and different content and communication. And I think as long as any, um, any brand, I guess, or a content rights owner comes to those platforms knowing that, that, then you get a variation. It's when you just try and recreate something for TV, let's just stick it on YouTube. It was actually made for a different platform. Or you talk to an audience on Instagram in the same way you would do on Twitter. It's about making sure that the, all, all of these platforms kind of work together and are integrated in the approach. Yeah, so David? YouTube's where the world comes to watch. Billion users every month, 400 hours of content uploaded every minute. There's a th thousands of flowers blooming every day. Innovation is alive and well on YouTube. So you see brands doing more and more great creative work, you know, starting by running TV Creative Online and then actually understanding the platform better and better taking out a whole load of new ways and tools of measuring what they're doing, seeing what's working, testing and learning as they do it. So far from becoming formulaic, I think actually innovation is thriving on YouTube and brands are really at the heart of that. Four out of the top 10 trending videos last year were brands videos. And as they put paid media behind it to amplify it, but then really use the power of owned and owned together to drive the growth, they're seeing amazing results. And so I hope that innovation keeps on going. That's what we want to see. JP? Sorry, um, what was the question? It was, I, it was I'm a... reading the, there's a question here. How do you snack on content? Sounds delicious. <laughs> well, if you wanted to answer that one, uh, that's great. <laughs> no, no, I, sorry, <laughs> yes. uh, I, I well, no, was distracted more, by that. It was more about with these platforms and their offerings, what do you do and how do you use the mix of platforms and uh, products that your companies have to make sure it doesn't result in being formulaic? How do you, you know, the mix between, say, Vine and Periscope and Twitter, as it were? Oh, wow. There's nothing formulaic uh, right now in, uh, in our industry. Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's all about try and, and iterating and getting better. Uh, I really believe that uh, mobile video consumption, social content creation is, is, is at the beginning. Um, and while YouTube is an old, uh, it's our older uh, uncle, um, I would say, um, they're still growing like crazy, uh, we're growing like crazy, and, um, and everything we, we do is tend to be the first time, and then we you know, make some mistakes, we get better, we iterate, and, uh, and, uh, and hopefully we get better. Uh, Periscope, uh, again, um, we're brand new on Periscope, and uh, five years from now, we're going to look back and say, wow, we, we had no idea uh, what Periscope could become. 
So uh, that's why it's, I think it's a fascinating, uh, you know, time to be in this industry. Uh, whether you are on the on the communication side, on the content side, on the platform side, because uh, almost everything is uh, is up for uh, reinvention. Okay. Um, final question in our last minute or so. Mobile World Congress. We have literally the world's brands and telcos and handset manufacturers coming here in a very short, pithy, punchy way. Please tell us why these stakeholders should be working with your business, your talent, your content. Start with Dom. Uh, I think in a pithy, punchy way to lead on also from the last question is that the thing that will stop this becoming formulaic or social video becoming formulaic is the influx of budget and brands and networks leaning in to create new stuff. And I think that the popcorn analogy that Mark used earlier, and that the profit made from popcorn in the cinema caused the product being shown on the screens in cinema to get better and better and better. And I think that's what can happen here. Marcus and I took a stroll around just two halls here earlier and were just wide-eyed and open-mouthed at the scale of this industry. It's the first time I've been to Mobile World Congress. And a, an industry of this size, and if it leans in to social video, could create an enormous opportunity. We haven't worked with any operators or uh, franchises or networks or you know, infrastructure before in this, so it, it, the possibilities are huge. Yeah, so I'd say there's never been a more exciting time to be a marketer. The pace of innovation just keeps on accelerating and gets better and better all the time. And so be where your audience is. Consumer behavior is changing fast. YouTube is now where the world comes to watch. And so be where your audience is. JP? That's a great... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to, I'm going to build on that. Um, whether you're a brand, a content creator, a user, a person in the world, if you want a live connection to culture, you join Twitter. <laughs> um, I think we're kind of just kind of scratching the surface of the content that we're going to be creating. You have such a big proliferation of mobile devices, GoPros and drones, and I'm really excited to see about the, the more content that people are going to create. Great. Well, all it behoves me to do is to say thank you to Dom, to David, to JP, and to John for a fantastic session. Thank you for your appreciation. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff.